Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Animus Corporation, providing insulin delivery products for people living with diabetes and part of the One Touch family. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, after more than 4,000 miles, 10 weeks, 20 riders who lived with type 1 for a combined 263 years have completed Bike Beyond, an epic cross-country adventure. And while all those numbers are extraordinary, they say the most amazing part may have just been feeling ordinary. I've had my type 1 for 17 years now, and I'm uh, 68 days into feeling normal for the first time out of those 17 years. So, <laughs> so it's like, it's the first summer where I didn't feel self-conscious about jumping in the pool with my Dexcom and my, you know, Omnipod. It was the first summer where I didn't feel weird. That's Walt Drennan, who had the idea to do this crazy thing a couple of years ago. You'll hear from him and many other writers about what they faced along the journey, how they feel to finish it, and what went right and wrong. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week of the show. I'm so glad you could join me. I'm Stacy Sims, and what we try to do here on Diabetes Connections is educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection from celebrities and actors and athletes in our community, as well as individuals who are not biking across the country or, you know, playing professional football with type 1, but just living day to day with this condition. My son was diagnosed when he was two, just before he turned two in 2006. He is going into seventh grade. He is 12 and a half. And I have spent my whole career in broadcasting, local TV anchor and radio host, that sort of thing. So I've been doing this podcast for two years now, since 2015. And if you're new, I am thrilled to have you along, just like all the other regular listeners week to week. And if you are a regular listener, you know that we have been following Bike Beyond since it kicked off in June. Every week, we have profiled another rider on this incredible adventure. And what was fun is you're going to hear some sound from one of the last stops they did in California in the Napa Valley. And you'll hear some sounds, some interviews that we did on a rest day just before the finish a couple days previous when they had a rest day in Colorado when much of the team was in a hot tub. And you may be interested to know, this was not the first diabetes podcast to take place from a hot tub. Didn't know that was a thing, did you? Well, there is another great podcast called Real Life Diabetes. It's from the people who bring you the website Diabetes Daily Grind. They're just fantastic. Two adults with type 1, Amber and Ryan. And they like to kind of, you know, myth bust and, and talk about real life issues. So they did an episode from a hot tub to talk about and find out more about their effect on blood sugar. Now, I don't know how scientific this all was, but it was fun to listen to. So I'll link up the episode in the show notes. And yeah, it's a great fun podcast. And I'm laughing because who knew that we would be doing the second diabetes podcast hot tub episode. And Amber and Ryan have an event coming up in their community. If you're anywhere near Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, it is the Real Life Diabetes Connection Happy Hour number six at the Oak and Ore on August 24th. I'll link that up uh, as well with the, the hot tub episode if you're anywhere in that area. Let me tell you a little bit about one of our sponsors, about Animus, and choosing an insulin pump is an important decision. I feel very fortunate that our certified diabetes educator, Lynette, really worked with us to educate us about all of our options. I mean, it was a long time ago. Benny was two, but she listened to what we wanted in an insulin pump. And after more than 10 years with Animus, I know it was the right decision. You know, Benny has been using Animus products. He's on the ping right now, and we continue to be impressed with everything 
everything, including the stellar customer service. That's why I'm always so glad to tell you about our experience and why I'd urge you to learn more about Animus Insulin Pumps. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Animus part of the One Touch family logo. Bringing you the conclusion of Bike Beyond means that the summer calendar is really almost over. In fact, where I am in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, summer is just winding down. My kids went back to school this week. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, you know, here we go. My daughter is a junior in high school now, and Benny is uh, entering seventh grade. It is hard to believe. And man, they still, this is so early. We go, I'm from New York, so it still seems like anything before Labor Day is way too early. But as we look at the calendar, I just want to let you know, I'm going to be speaking um, and making some appearances in the weeks to come. So if you're anywhere near the triad area of North Carolina, Greensboro area, I'm going to be speaking to that JDRF chapter at their summit in September. I'll be at the Unconference Weekend for Women in uh, Virginia in October, and then at the JDRF Summit for the Tampa, Florida chapter in December. I do a bunch of different presentations. If you're at all interested in finding out more, drop me a line. Stacy, S-T-A-C-E-Y, at diabetes-connections.com. I would love to talk to your group. It's not just about the podcast. I do lots of presentations about social media, about making real-life connections, about teenagers and parents. It's a lot of fun. Also, just a little bit of housekeeping, if I may. However you're listening to the show, I get people listening through Facebook and Twitter, through iTunes, through different podcast apps for Android. We do have our own app, Diabetes Connections. You can get it in the Android App Store or Apple uh, app, app Store, wherever you get your apps, Diabetes Connections is there. And uh, in my opinion, that's the best way to get it. You cut out the middleman. You don't have to worry if there's an issue uploading or anything like that. It's always there. And it's really easy to search. If you're new to the show, we have two years of this podcast. I do it every week. And you can search for subjects. You can search for different episodes for people or just go through episode by episode. And you can do that in the Diabetes Connection app very easily. You can also do it on the homepage, diabetes-connections.com, in the little search bar. Just put in, you know, Disney World or CGM, whatever you want to look up. We have probably done a show. Um, and if you don't see what you want, again, let me know what you would like to hear more about. I've had so much fun following this ride over the summer. It's not just the individuals that I've gotten to know and, you know, looking at Instagram and, and keeping track. And I talk about this a little bit in, in some of these interviews later on. It's seeing the support vehicles that have messages on the side all about type 1. You know, here are the warning signs. Here's education. Knowing that this is going across the country and people are getting better good information about type 1. It's knowing that kids and families who may not have a community, you know, where they are, they may not have a camp, they may not have a, a JDRF chapter or something like that, that they're getting to meet people with type 1 who are not sitting at home, you know, who are not letting it get them down. It's all of that and so much more. So I found myself getting kind of emotional here and there. And I can only imagine what was going through the minds of the riders and their families and everybody present when they finished. Here is what it sounded like. All right, we've got the finish line here. Woo! Here they come. They're right down there at the end of the trail, about to cross the final line. Oh my gosh, I'm already crying. To those of you tuning in, we are now here at the Chrissy Field finish line of Team Bike Beyond, 70 days from New York to San Francisco. Everyone said it was impossible, and here they are, 20 riders, all with type 1, breaking stereotypes, truly showing what it means to live beyond type 1. <laughs> Alright, so next, 
They are going to have the front wheel dip into the Pacific. They dip their back tires in the Atlantic in New York, and now the front dip in the Pacific. Welcome, Team Mike Beyond Europe! That is so cool. New York to California, 10 weeks, a life-changing adventure. And I'm, I'm so grateful that they let me be a very small part of it. One of the sponsors of Bike Beyond is also one of our sponsors, and that is Dexcom. And one of the best things about the Dexcom system is being able to send more information and communicate more clearly with our endocrinologist. The Dexcom G5 Mobile CGM system gives you a reading every five minutes so that you can spot trends and get a dynamic picture of your blood glucose levels. At this point, as Benny is hitting the teen years, we are adjusting a lot and being able to send our information through Dexcom Clarity to our endo makes appointments a lot more productive. Our doctor has more info related to Benny's glucose levels. Managing diabetes is not easy, but I feel like we have one of the very best CGM systems working for us. CGM-based treatment requires finger sticks for calibration may result in hypoglycemia if calibration not performed or symptoms expectations do not match CGM readings. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Love hearing that music. Oh, so back in June, you met Walter Drennan and Sarah Lucas. Sarah is the CEO of Beyond Type 1, which, of course, is the organization putting on Bike Beyond. And Walt, he's the program coordinator for Bike Beyond. He's a team member, but he is really the person who got all this going. As you will hear in a moment, he, he talks a little bit about it. He had this idea a couple of years ago. He brought Bike Beyond into it. And the rest of it is the story you've been hearing over the summer. The team stopped in Napa for a fundraiser and to thank a lot of the people that have been coming out to see them and, and talk to them along the way. And I wanted to share what Walt had to say, because as I talk to more and more of these writers, it seems like it's not just about the physical accomplishment. It's more about, and he'll say it a lot better than I can, being with people who are like you, feeling like you belong, you don't have to explain. So here is Walt Drennan speaking about a week before the end of Bike Beyond. So my involvement with Bike Beyond goes kind of further back a little bit. Um, I've actually done two cross-country bike rides before, uh, but on those teams, I was the only type one. So if you, can, if you can kind of wrap your head around trying to bike across the country and how hard that is, imagine trying to do it with your type one and being the only one having to deal with it. So being the only one that understands it, being the only one that really um, needs that, that kind of extra support, but you're not really seeing it. So after those rides, I had an incredible experience despite that. Um, but I thought that it'd be really great if I could get a group of type ones together to do that kind of ride and just support each other and create an environment where uh, biking and type one management are kind of one and the same and a lot easier for everybody. Um, so that was about five years ago, five years ago when I did my first one and I started trying to like hunt down uh, groups that would be able to help me put this on because I can't, it's very hard to put on a cross country bike ride by yourself, let alone with a team. Um, and I got a lot of no's. It was a lot of, this is a great idea, but we can help you. Why don't you try these people? So it was a lot of kind of getting the run around. Um, and this was actually before Beyond Type 1 ever even uh, existed. Um, so after about a year and a half ago, I was randomly, I was kind of, I had another kind of spurt of energy to try and get something like this off the ground. So I went on Facebook looking for Type 1 groups, and then Beyond Type 1 popped up first in the list. I was like, okay, this I read the mission. It sounded great, living beyond Type 1, exactly what I wanted to do. So I sent them a message. I was like, hi, my name is Walt. I've done, a, I did, I've done two cross-country bike rides over 4,000 miles. I think like the Type 1 community, Type 1 people in general could really benefit from doing something like that. And I was like, what do you think? Do you think you could help me out? And I got a message maybe two or three days later saying, yeah, let's talk about it. And that was about a year and a half ago. And now here we are today, 68 days into our 70-day trip. And um, I think this specific ride 
personally means a lot to me just because it's a very extreme um, experience in feeling normal for the first time. Like uh, before I said, I've had my type one for 17 years now and I'm uh, 68 days into feeling normal for the first time out of those 17 years. So, <laughs> so it's like, it's the first summer where I didn't feel self-conscious about jumping in the pool with my Dexcom and my you know, Omnipod. It was the first summer where I didn't feel weird for pulling out a vial of insulin and filling it up in the restaurant. And it's the first time that I didn't feel silly for asking for a low snack as we're going down into the deepest tunnels in America, out, out Mammoth Park, um, because I was feeling, uh, I had an extreme low at that time. Um, so I think uh, nowadays normal is a very underrated feeling, especially for people that, you know, kind of generally fit in with that kind of uh, demographic. But type ones especially, I feel, kind of seek that out, especially those brief moments throughout the day where we feel normal for once, because it's very hard what we do every day to kind of get to normal. Um, so I actually thank all of you for helping us because without you, this wouldn't have been possible. So thank you very much. Hey, big thanks to Families Fighting Type 1 and Aaron Johnson for taking that video. That was a Facebook Live video that I grabbed the audio from, and I'll link that up in the show notes as well. So you can see the whole, it's about a 20, 25 minute video of the team talking about their accomplishments and their experiences. And Families Fighting Type 1 is a local group here uh, in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And they do a lot of good stuff. And they were particularly supportive of one of the writers who's from this area. Abby Pepper is the youngest writer in Bike Beyond. She's 17. And uh, they've been doing fundraisers for her. I went to one at a bar recently here in Charlotte, which was a lot of fun. So they went out. They went out to California and got that video and did a whole bunch of other stuff. So big thanks, Aaron, for letting me use that. I really appreciate it. Okay. One of the hardest things about talking to the riders is is actually talking to them while they're biking across the country. Because as you can imagine, they're busy, then they're tired, and they're in remote locations. So they don't have cell service. You know, they're, they're not going to jump on a call or grab a Skype conversation with me. So we decided to hook up at a rest day about a week before they hit the finish line. So I was able to talk to six of the riders. You're going to hear from Perry Silverheart, Abby Brow, Cassidy Robinson, Jesse Levine, Sid Sharma, and Matt Swain. And I'll talk more about them as we go through. But everybody that you're about to hear is sitting in a hot tub at the same time. I am not in a hot tub. I am in my attic bonus room in hot, sweaty Charlotte, North Carolina, wishing I was with them having fun. But they'd worked a lot harder than I had the days previous, let's be honest. So if you hear a little giggling or, you know, a little sound coming in and out, <laughs> that's what's going on. So we're going to start with Perry. Perry's 22. She was diagnosed with type 1 in 1997. Um, Big time athlete. She was uh, NCAA track and field. She has, you know, been a hiker, that sort of thing. And she is the social media and activities coordinator for Bike Beyond. Has it been fun? It seems like it's been awfully hard work. Hard work, but fun hard work. Rewarding hard work. Definitely worth it. I know you have a ways to go still, but what's been the hardest part for you? Was there a stretch that you felt, this is just a lot more than I signed up for? So we just crossed from Nevada to California yesterday, and Nevada was definitely um, (laughs) the most challenging it was hot. We were on the same road the entire state, so basically just running street every day. And it was a ton of climbing, which I don't think any of us had anticipated. Um, it was basically just up one mountain, down into a valley, up another, kind of over and over every day for four or five days. Wow. <laughs> so I think, honestly, the, the most difficult state that we've been through in, like going into the Rockies, for example, we were all super mentally prepared for that, um, had been kind of hyping it up and getting ready for it. And I think in retrospect, Nevada was a lot harder, but we kind of put no energy into preparing for that difficulty. (laughs) Um, So I think we're all happy to be done now. (laughs) (laughs) And Perry, you are an athlete. I mean, you track and field, um, you've hiked before, you know, you're not somebody who's been on just taking a couple of spin classes to get ready for this. Do you feel like this is one of the most challenging things you've done, though? Yeah, 
for sure. And, you know, in the beginning of the trip, I might not have said that. I might, I, for a long time, kind of thought that some hiking that I've done was a lot more challenging than this trip. But as weeks have worn on and my body's gotten more tired and climbing has increased, this is definitely, yeah, I'd say without a doubt, the hardest physical challenge I've worked through. Why did you want to do this? Um, <laughs> for a lot of reasons, but the idea of big on, I guess, physical challenges last summer, um, attempted to hike from the Southern to Northern border of the state of Vermont. It's a 272 mile long trail. And I ended up not quite finishing having to come off trail about 70 miles early because of a, a sprained ankle, mm-hmm. but I felt like this was a very similar kind of like mindset challenge, but an even bigger and more exciting challenge and for a cause that I care a lot about. And for me, it also is that, the kind of physical challenge, but also the community that comes with it, which both within this team and in all of the communities that we've um, visited and gotten to spend time with along the way has been incredible and absolutely what I was hoping for. Do you feel at all changed in your type one management or your type one mindset? I am definitely a lot more open about my type one and management than I was at the beginning of this ride. Not that I I don't feel like I was ever shy about the fact that I have diabetes, but it's not necessarily that something that I talked openly about in my life every day. And I think that this trip, I've begun to talk a lot more openly about it. And I think my management has benefited from that openness as well. And that's something that I, I hope will continue into my life beyond this trip. All of these riders have an extraordinary story. Abby Brow is 29. She was diagnosed in 2010. And, you know, she casually will mention that she swam around the island of Manhattan. Um, yeah, she's pretty accomplished, very accomplished swimmer. She talks about it here. She is a Bike Beyond team leader, and she's just one of those people that, you know, is so laid back about accomplishments like this. Anyway, here's Abby. How are you feeling right now? How's your body holding up? How are you doing? Um, pretty good. I think right now, like, we're having through a rest day, so things are, you know, feeling rested again. I slept in and had a long nap, so (laughs) I'm feeling really good. But I think in general, I mean, tired like generally worn down, but also like really strong. I think we did this climb yesterday over Daggett Summit in when we were coming into Tahoe. And I don't know if we were like overly mentally prepared for it to be really hard, but the whole climb felt really good and it just felt really strong and it kind of like felt like the best climb we've done for me at least. And so that was a really um positive experience and just something that like even though we're tired, like I felt like my body's getting stronger and just in a really good place, which is really nice. I think the tiredness comes from just not being able to rest as much as you should if you're biking as much as we are. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me a little bit about yourself, because we didn't get a chance to talk before the event started, but you have done some interesting athletic uh, events in your life, like swimming around Manhattan. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I was a... I've been... I competed in summer since like fourth grade, and then I swam in high school and college. And then in college, I mean, I just kept doing longer distances, and kind of like the longer the distance, the better I was. And a coach of mine just kind of saw that he had coached open water swimmers previously, and was kind of like, "You need to try open water swimming because I think that where you're going to see the best results." And I didn't really get into a question until actually because I was diagnosed with type 1 um, right before I graduated college. And it mm-hmm. wasn't until the summer after I was diagnosed, so about a year after I graduated, that I actually did my first open water swim. And I had kind of plans like before I was diagnosed. I was like, yes, I need to do this. Like, And then I I just did like one mile. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I need to do more. And then I did three and then five. And I just kind of like... I don't know how to explain it. You do them and you're just like, yes, this is what I can do. And, and 
then you just start setting goals to go further and further. I always kind of think of it that it's like somebody who does a 5K and then they do a 10K, you know, run, and then they're going to do a half marathon and then a and then a marathon. And so I just have kind of like been furthering all of the distances in the swim world. And I just, yeah, so now I have all these goals to do all these amazing open water swims. Um, so Manhattan was is the longest and hardest one I've done to date. It's part of a goal that I had before I graduated college and before I was diagnosed is to do the triple crown of open water swimming, which is the Manhattan Island Marathon Swim, the English Channel, and the Catalina Island uh, Swim. And so Manhattan was kind of like the first of those three for me. And it definitely took a long time to get there. I mean, I made that goal for myself in 2010. And then, you know, it was 2016 when I was finally able to complete it. But um, it's kind of like baby steps. And it's definitely a challenge in type 1 does not help <laughs> um, it creates more of a challenge <laughs> but I think it's one of those things too with everything that's like one you know you just have to be a little bit more prepared and you have to think ahead a little bit and so I just had to kind of think about what those challenges that type one would bring to the swim and then find solutions for them biggest being that you can't touch the boat or your support kayak while you're swimming or you're disqualified from the swim so it doesn't count <laughs> oh wow so checking your blood sugars in the water where your test strips and your meter and nothing can get wet. It's like, okay, how am I going to do that? Wow. Um, so it's fun things like that, that I mean, you just end up treading water and figuring it out. But I don't know. That was my biggest accomplishment to date till this ride. <laughs> and then I went on this ride and now I'm already like the Rocky beat that hands down. Like the sense of accomplishment I felt after riding a bike over the Rockies is way more than I had um, after doing that swim. And I think that's because swimming has always been there for me. I've always, I know that I can push myself in the pool. I know how to do that, but I never really was riding a bike to this extent before. So I never really, it never really crossed my mind that I would be pushing myself to the levels that I have on this ride, like on a bike. Like it just not, wasn't on my radar that this would be something I'm doing. So I think it's kind of like, yeah, I, I always think you can do whatever you want as long as you train for it. But I've always kind of said that in context of swimming, which is something that I know how to do and I'm good at. Right. So to do it in the context of something that like I didn't really feel comfortable on before, like on a bike, was um, a big deal for me. Yeah. I know you're not done, but um, are you happy right. you did this? So happy. Oh, my God. I wouldn't have changed my decision for anything. I think... I wasn't really sure like when I applied, it was kind of like, well, I don't know. I probably don't get picked. Like, let me just like throw in an application and see what happens. And if I get picked, I'll figure things out from there. And then as soon as I applied, then I all of a sudden got this feeling like, oh my gosh, if they don't pick me, I'm going to be devastated. I'm going to be so <laughs> bummed because I just all of a sudden was like, no, I have to do this. I want to do this. And it's been amazing. Just, yeah. I mean, like I said, the accomplishments are incredible. The whole experience of spending time with 10 strangers for 10 weeks, like 24 seven is life-changing kind of just makes you think about a lot of things differently type one management included but also just a million other things and how you live your life and how you go about your day-to-day -day. and then yeah type one management has definitely meeting some of the people that are on this team um, and how talented they are in their own respects like in their own endeavors has been amazing to hear how they manage it different things like with Perry with her hiking Mel's an ultra runner like everyone that does all their things it's like I've learned so much and I will definitely take so much away from the ride and probably manage my type one differently for swimming and my events going forward, which is huge, but then also just in like my daily life. Cause I don't know, you're not surrounded by, I'm not surrounded by a ton of type one every day. So you all of a sudden are like open to so many more different ways to manage your type one and like different things to try to see like how it affects you and what the best way it is for you. So yeah, super glad I did it don't want it to be over but you know I, I guess I'm ready to be done sleeping on the floor um <laughs> but I'm not I'm not like ready to be done hanging out with all these people because they're a pretty good time during this interview I forgot to mention while I was talking to all the writers somebody took a picture of them hanging out in the hot tub 
and posted it on Twitter. So I will make sure when this episode goes out that I post that picture on Facebook. And I took a picture of me in my in my attic room doing the podcast. It's not as exciting as their picture, but I'll definitely post both of those so you can see what was going on. I, I love these guys. So next is Matt Swain. He is 25. He's from Toronto. He was diagnosed in 2007. So coming up on 10 years uh, this November, and he is one of the logistics coordinators for Bike Beyond. How big is that hot tub? This is a really big hot tub. Yeah, I imagine so. Far so far we've got six people in the room. It's probably just like 12. <laughs> we could fit the entire team if we wanted to. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. So Matt, how are you doing? How are you holding up? Um, I'm doing really well. I think uh, now that we've done so much climbing, I think our bodies are so like accustomed to it and so strong at this point that I don't think any of the, the recent climbing has been nearly as bad as we thought it would be. And uh, yeah, the whole team is really coming together and just able to enjoy these last couple of weeks and couple of days together um, before time to call it quits. So you are one of the logistics coordinators. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges or a night or two, you know, finding places to stay along the way, that kind of thing? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So there was five logistics coordinators. Um, I was one of them, and since it was 10 weeks, we divided up into two-week segments for each uh, logistics coordinator. So um, basically, this entails, A, finding lodging, which is the most important part, roof over our heads, ideally. And then uh, from there, we tried to get meals um, donated by community members, and then like dinner being the biggest one, and if possible, a breakfast the next day. And there's always things like making sure we have access to showers. Um, laundry is really key for people. And then, like, the comfort of home, like Wi-Fi and uh, people that would let us use, like, mail drops uh, to get packages from home and stuff. <clears throat> but the, uh, the challenge for me, I guess, was in the smaller communities where we didn't have a Beyond Type 1 contact already. It was just trying to find, uh, get touch base with someone who was willing to help us and kind of, like, do a bunch of legwork for us um, and securing the lodging and food, etc. Did you have any close calls where you're biking along and stressing out about where you're going to sleep that night? Uh, I think I always knew where we were going to sleep. Uh, sometimes it's because of you know, a lot of these, none of these places I've ever been to before. Um, you're just kind of unsure of like the quality of the uh, the lodging. I mean, obviously the people who are doing this for us did the best they could. But when I was doing the, like a bunch of my the legwork, it was probably February. In Canada, and it's cold. And the last thing I would think of then would be to ask, like, is there air conditioning in the uh, school gym? Um, and in some of the places, it turned out there definitely was not. <laughs> so that was a bit of a surprise when he rolled in all hot and sweaty and found out there was no air conditioning. But it's one of the things that the team was uh, forced to and able to deal with along the way. <laughs> kind of one of those things you'll look back on and laugh about in a couple of weeks. But at the time, Nobody was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're coming up on 10 years of living with type 1. Uh, is this the kind of thing you ever thought you would do for your 10-year diversary? Definitely not for my diversary, but uh, I had done another cycling trip of my own um, before this, when I graduated from college. Uh, myself and two fraternity brothers of mine took off and did a uh, three-week bike ride through eastern Canada. Wow. And that one was fully self-supported, so we didn't have a van or we didn't have places to stay. There was also no schedule, um, which was nice in its own kind of way. And we didn't have any sponsors either, so our bikes were not as nice as they currently are. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was able to make it work, and um, using things like the Dexcom and, and my diabetes support network from uh, from back home, able to manage my sugars and, uh, and enjoy the ride just like the other two guys. How did this compare? I mean, I hate—I know it's a completely different experience, but was this more difficult physically? Was it easier to have people with type 1 around you? Yeah, I mean, uh, this well, this trip was about diabetes, so that was the biggest difference. Um, on my other trip, it was just kind of an obstacle that I more or less dealt with on my own unless I really needed help and I had to call someone mm. um, to figure something out. But this trip is different, too, because essentially it was just, 20 strangers meeting up in New York. Um, other than like a Facebook presence, we didn't really know each other or know if we'd be compatible or whatever. And then uh, we were just kind of forced to make it work and, and live together for 10 weeks, which was 
probably the hardest part of, of this trip and the most, I guess, enjoyable in the long run because that's the stuff that I'm going to remember, I think, for the rest of my life. One of the bikers I got to talk to before the whole thing started was Sid Sharma. And man, was he interesting. He is, uh, he lives in the UK. He is from India and that's where he was diagnosed. And you can, you can hear his interview um, a couple of weeks ago here on the podcast about his story about being diagnosed in India and then going back to live in the UK. Um, but he was very much looking forward to biking across the U.S. and seeing the middle of the country, you know, not just the East Coast, not just the West Coast. So I was sure to ask him about that. Um, Sid is 28, and he was diagnosed in 2015. Has the ride met or exceeded your expectations? Exceeded my expectations in every way. Tell me a little bit about how it's been for you. I mean, we were all walking into an unknown unknown because I don't think any of us have traveled across America in this way. None of us had been with each other, like in a 24-7, 10-week environment. And uh, I think also in terms of just the generosity of our all of our, of our hosts, uh, every town uh, or city we went to, we thought, okay, this is great. This can't be topped up. And you go to the next place and they up the scale and then you go to the next place and they do the same. And so I think that has been exceptional because yes we are cycling cross country yes that's a huge challenge but i think the most rewarding part has been meeting other type 1 diabetics and our hosts and seeing the love and affection they have for us as a team and what we're doing i'll tell you sid and i thought i knew a lot about this ride but when i saw the first instagram pictures of the support vehicle with the signs on the side with the the signs the symptoms the information about type 1 i got kind of emotional uh -huh. thinking about people looking out their windows of their cars and seeing that and knowing that that's really going to help somebody. How did you feel seeing those signs and knowing that you were making a difference as you talked to people along the way? I think that's been one of the most amazing parts of this trip. You know, we walk into a place, people see our Dexcom, people see our pumps, and they come up to us and say, hey, you know, we've also got type 1 diabetes. And uh, like, I mean, today was a great example. Uh, we were in CVS and we were just looking for some of our own personal stuff. <laughs> And this girl comes up and talks to us and, and, and says, hey, look at your Dexcom. I've got this pump and I've got a Dexcom too. And she wanted to take a picture. And then we go to the checkout point and the guy who's serving us has type 1 diabetes for 20 years. Wow. And so instances like that have been happening all over. And I think having our van with all beyond type 1 on it and the map and all the symptoms of type 1 diabetes, I think that has been one of the biggest attractors for people. I mean, in, in Moab, we went up to the arches and when we were down at the visitor center, somebody just pulled up on the side and uh, immediately took out the pump and said, hey, I'm part of your family too. Ah. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, you know, so <laughs> there have been so many instances for all of us across this whole trip, from young kids to parents to people who know somebody living with type 1 diabetes. And uh, I, I think that's been the biggest uh, wow factor for me on this trip, apart from the scenery, has been the people and and how it doesn't matter what age you're at, uh, everybody knows what you're going through and the connection is instant. When we spoke weeks and weeks ago before the ride started, you were looking forward to seeing the landscape of America, you know, not just New York, not yeah. just California. How has that been for you? Did you get to see what you wanted? Oh, and some more. I think uh, <laughs> my team has gotten bored of me saying, oh, and wow. And, <laughs> oh, I never thought I'd be here and I never thought I'll be doing this. And uh, uh, you know, it's from simple things like eating Dairy Queen ice cream to climbing <laughs> up Rockies to being in Utah uh, at the Arches, uh, cycling in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, in Nevada. But I think one thing I didn't account for was not doing it on my own. I was doing it with 19 other people who I've gotten to know, become friends with. And, and as team leader, you know, we talked about one team, one family, and it's really become a family now. And it's great to see that transition from... 20 strangers and 19 strangers meeting up in New York City to where we are today in this hot tub. It's, it's an incredible journey. As we talk to these amazing riders, please keep in mind that Bike Beyond is a fundraising event. So every rider has their own fundraising page. They are raising money for the great things that Bike Beyond supports. And I will link that up in the show notes as well. You can see where the money goes. Terrific diabetes organizations. So my next rider or 
honestly, the person they passed the phone to in the hot tub next is Cassidy Robinson. She was diagnosed in 1993. She's 26, and she has always wanted to bike across the United States because her dad did it in his 20s. It's amazing to me, as I talk to all of these writers, how many people have had this as a goal or have had people in their family who have done it. It's just remarkable to me as the couch potato that I'm finding out that I am. So anyway, here's Cassidy Robinson. So my father cycled cross country when he graduated from college. So I grew up hearing his story of traveling cross country. Um, He was with, there was five of them. And I heard those stories my entire childhood. So it's like this kind of adventure that I always had in the back of my mind, but I didn't necessarily know like how it was going to happen. And the way that I thought about it happening would be much more similar to what he did, which was, it was like five athletic guys just figuring it out day to day on the road. They had a map and they had a trail and they just followed it and they camped out where they could. They slept in colleges where they could. They slept in churches and parks where they could. Oh, it was like a trip for them that was a little bit more by the seat of their pants. And so I think that's probably the way that I imagined this going for myself. And Bike Down has been a much more organized adventure. Um, I was the logistics coordinator for the first two weeks of our trip from New York City to Cleveland. So that meant that I was part of the team that organized the adventure, too. So I knew that it was going to be different than the way that I had I've been imagining it my entire life, like from the beginning. Was but that okay, though? It's been amazing. Oh, well, it sounds like Absolutely. it's been Oh, no, absolutely. It's been wonderful. And I actually have other type 1 diabetic friends who cycled on the Transamerica Trail this summer. One of them just finished a few days ago on Thursday last week. Um, And one of them is still out on the trail. And they're kind of doing it the way that my father did. And it's been fun for me to connect with my friends that are doing that and to see how fortunate I am to have the support of Beyond Type 1 and to have the support of my teammates to have access to food and low snacks at all times, communities that communities that like take us in and feed us and house us. They put a roof over our heads every night. Like that's it's remarkable. Did you have any moments uh, during this trip where you really needed that assistance? I'm trying to think. Me personally, I know there've been a couple of any... minor injuries and things like that. I wasn't sure if that was something you'd had. Yeah, you know, I actually my really recent experience with actually like needing one of the support vans was the day that we so we were camping in Capitol Reef and Walt and I rode out the next morning when we left and I'd just been fighting low blood sugar for three days in a row and we had had three three days of like a fair amount of climbing in Utah and I was climbing like with my blood sugar in the 60s for three entire days and it was hot. It was 90 degrees, 100 degrees. And I couldn't get my blood sugar out of the 650s and 60s to save my life. And Walt and I didn't even make it 11 miles that day before, like, the trailer van actually circled back around to check on us and find us. Because we didn't have any cell service to know to where we were. Thing is that we hadn't showed up to the water stop. And basically, the reason we hadn't is because my blood sugar was so low that we had to continue stopping to just treat my lows and I was also having like rear tire flats I had three rear tire flats within oh. 11 miles and couldn't get my blood sugar like above 60 and so it was, it was actually Perry and Sierra in the van in the trailer van that came to check on us and they they kind of slowed down and drove past us and they said hey are you guys okay and I just shouted no because I couldn't be on my bike anymore I just I couldn't cycle with low blood sugar anymore I couldn't eat another low snack. I, for the life of me, could not do it. I couldn't change another flat. And so it was like the first day of the entire trip where like actually for me personally, out on a ride, I desperately, desperately needed the van and it was there. Wow. Like obviously it would have continued like treating those and would have gotten out of the situation no matter what it took. But like knowing that the vans were there and that someone was looking out for us, like it's a blessing. That's great. That's great. I'm glad you're doing okay. Yeah, I really needed that. Yeah. I know you're not finished yet, but no. any thoughts for when you cross that line? I mean, do you have any idea what might be going through your head or what, is there anything you want to think about or am I going to jinx it? Um, no, I mean, I've been, there's, I've kind of avoided thinking about it for a while because <laughs> I'm getting a little emotional about saying goodbye to my teammates, but now I'm ready. Like we're in California, we're in my home state. I've cycled basically back home and 
I don't know. I think for me, like my father is going to be waiting. He was not there in New York City when we did the tour, but he's going to be waiting in San Francisco when we get our tires. And now he and I have this this adventure. It's all they were different. We have this adventure in common, and it's a thing that like we connect on very deeply. So I'm really excited to like to see my dad's face, but I will be extremely, extremely emotional, and I'm sure like experience a whole lot of separation anxiety in like saying goodbye to my teammates. Yeah. I didn't know what it would be like to like live with strangers for 10 weeks, but I just can't, I can't be rid of these funny people like laughing behind me in this hot tub. Like, <laughs> it's going to be strange to be away from everyone. I can't imagine like, I can't imagine giving up our like water break dance parties. <laughs> and did you know anybody on the trip before you started? Um, no, none of us did. I had, I met Elliot, uh, briefly at the JDRF Type 1 Nation Summit in New York City. So that was cool. I got to like spend a couple of hours with him there, but no. Wow. As Sylvie likes to say, we were, we were all, uh, online dating each other and then we got to meet in real life. Before I introduce the next guest, I owe him a huge apology. I'm very careful with names. I, I really, I do homework. I try very hard. I ask everybody how to pronounce their name. And I'm so sorry, Jesse. I pronounced your last name incorrectly on the show where you were featured. And I feel terrible about that. Jesse Levine is the next writer here. Jesse, you are so understanding. Jesse is 22. He was diagnosed uh, back in 2006. He had said in his bio that he likes riding his bike with no handlebars. I'm assuming that that did not happen at all along the way. But it was fun to talk to Jesse about his experiences here. So this is the last hot tub interview that I did. Here's Jesse Levine. So how are you holding up? How's the trip going for you? Oh, pretty good. This trip, I think I'm going to walk away having learned a lot and also having challenged myself to extremes that I've never seen in my eyelids before. <laughs> Tell me about that. You mean extremes of, of nature, extremes of your body? <laughs> no, I think that, yeah, I, everything. Um, extremes of like physical challenges and also paired with the constant managing of type 1 diabetes. I guess what I mean by that is like, before this ride, I felt like I had my diabetes in pretty good control. But on this ride, I feel like I've had to relearn my diabetes management from from the beginning. <laughs> Just because the physical challenges, this is nothing like I've ever done before. It's like you're sleeping not that much. You're biking more than ever, biking every day. And you're eating food. Like we have amazing sponsors that like ride us with really good nutrition. But I feel like the times that I manage my diabetes best are when I have a schedule and yes, we are on we are on a schedule here, but every day is so crazy, and the schedule is always changing. So it's like you just kind of like you never really know how you're going to feel when you're going to bike. Yeah. Ha have you had uh, any days where you felt like you just couldn't you couldn't push anymore, or you have you had to struggle uh, at all that way? Yeah, I've had days like that. I feel like those have been more mental mm. um, than physical. There was uh, one like there was a span of like five days where. I, banned myself because I was dealing with some infections in my saddle area. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I am. Um, so that was pretty tough being in the band for those times. But I think we talked about this before I was um, about the diabetes education app that I'm creating. Right. And that was actually some really good time to like, you know, sit on my computer and just like crank out some work. So that was not, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not on my bike, but we're all still on this ride. And we're also raising awareness and meeting people along the way. And I'm still like doing work that I'm, that's fulfilling because I know that it's going to help people with type of diabetes in the future. There's also another day uh, where I had to, I, we had a 70 mile day and I only got 40 miles in. I just had to stop. I like, we were on the loneliest highway in America. And <laughs> it's as it sounds, there's nothing around. There's like a few towns and they're all stand within like, it's like 70 to 100 miles of each other and in between those those towns there's nothing so you have so much time to think and just kind of be in your head and that time to think about things you just have you you basically just have time to envision every single scenario for all of your thoughts and just like a million different ways that it could play out and i feel like that is really good to kind of have that space to think i don't really anticipate myself having a space to think like this in that open of a space ever again unless i do a bike trip like this 
but it's also can get to a point where you just want to turn your brain off. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just because it's like, there's so many thoughts going and it's like, whoa, kind of got to get off the bike and put some music in my ears and, uh, and just like quiet my mind down. And that was kind of a a strange experience. And I just like had to take a, like a mental health day, just like get in the van and just chill. Are you glad you did this? Yes. 100% yes. Saddle sores and all. (laughs) (laughs) What's that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say with all the, you know, it sounds like there were a few challenges out there. No. Yeah. I mean, living with type one diabetes every day, there are challenges. And this bike ride is no different, but just like my type one, I've learned so many valuable lessons from it. And growing up, it taught me to be more, more responsible and I think more mature than a lot of my peers. And, and I think, I think I'll get the same thing out of this bike ride. It's just like having an extreme challenge that you're just coming, you're just like coming over each day. And each day of this bike ride is really analogous to each day with type one. It just so happens that I'm doing this bike ride each day living with type one. Did you meet anybody along the way that stands out? I know you guys spoke at camps and you stayed in a lot of different places. Anything stand out to you that you'd like to share? It's hard to narrow it down to one person. I think all the kids with type 1 who I've met and all their parents that we've talked to are people that stand out to me in those endless thoughts in my mind. They're just amazing. And it's, and it's incredible to hear how different everyone lives with type 1. And some people that didn't before meeting us know anybody else with type 1. And it's, I think the cool, like really notable part of that is that we can rope them into the Beyond Type 1 community with, you know, almost a million members online and um, show them that there is a community out there, there is support, and there are people who do things that maybe you thought you couldn't do with Type 1. Do you have anything that you might be thinking when you finally finish this and you dip that front tire? That's interesting. I haven't really thought about thoughts that I'll have. Um, I thought about what I'm going to do and where I'm going to be. But yeah, I think after this bike ride, once I dip that tire, it'll be like a really big exhale and just saying, yes, we just did this. We just biked here from New York. And that's kind of what I'm focusing on thinking about. And I'm really excited to think those thoughts. That's <laughs> I'm already fantastic. thinking them now as, as we saw our first In-N-Out burger, um, <laughs> a huge sign of westward uh, distance traveled. <laughs> it's only a western franchise. <laughs> um, and also when we crossed the state line into California yesterday. It's just like such an incredible experience. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. You're doing an incredible thing. And I'm so glad to just share your stories a little bit. So get some rest. Don't shrivel up in the hot tub. Be careful. (laughs) Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Stacey. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Lots more information all about Bike Beyond at diabetes-connections.com and in the show notes, which is the description for every episode. I have started putting all the links you need right there so you can come to the homepage for the whole shebang. But if you need the information, anything you've heard about in the show, that will be in the show notes and that's available in the app and and pretty much wherever you're listening, except um, on Facebook and Twitter. It's really difficult to get that through social media. So if you're listening that way, come onto the website and you can get all the links and the info that you need. The Bike Beyond documentary is due this November to coincide with World Diabetes Day. We've talked about that as well. Neil Greathouse is putting that together, and I will keep you posted on it as the progress continues. But for right now, Bike Beyond is wrapped up. You can, of course, continue to donate, but I hope all of the riders are getting some well-earned rest and thinking about their incredible accomplishments. Again, Thanks so much to Beyond Type 1 for letting me tell these stories, for bringing this information out, and for just having fun getting to know all these people along the way. It's been a great summer. We have a lot of great shows coming up, some good information. I I do want to let you know that I'm probably going to put out a bonus episode this week or next because there are some news items with some urgency that I want to get out, especially about insulin pricing, some action that you can take, some organizations that are trying to make a difference. And the best way to make sure you get the bonus episodes is to get the app. Just get the Diabetes Connections app and it'll load up right away. You won't have to do anything else and subscribe to the newsletter as well. The links are in the show notes, so that should be really easy. Uh, I don't put a lot of bonus episodes out, but I do when there's something timely, and this is one of them. So I would look for that later this week or next week at the latest. 
In the meantime, thank you so much for joining me. I know your time is valuable and I appreciate you spending so much of it with me. I'm Stacey Sims and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.